Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Akshaya Morty. Akshaya is the Director of AI Transformation at Zendesk. Akshay, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks for having me, Spencer. It's been uh, it's been a while since we met. Yeah, quite How some time since, uh, since our startup back when we were both at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I've been good. How about yourself? Good. Uh, life has brought me to California. I moved here in 2015. Um, Pittsburgh was too cold, but uh, haven't done too many startups after that. Yeah, I did try my hand, failed three times, uh, but happy to see you flourish. Oh, thanks, buddy. Out of scene. What are you doing there? Well, what are you building up robots? You gonna replace humans? What are you doing? Nah, so uh, that's that's a popular misconception. So, um. <laughs> I, I own a company, SKA Robotics, that um, specializes in field robotics. So we work on outdoor autonomy, and we do like robots for inspection and maintenance, um, and uh, yeah, that sort of thing. So just robots that move. Um, I see. Specialty. We don't do like industrial integration or anything like that, and um, we employ some of the best engineers in the world to solve some of the toughest problems in the world. So that's, that's amazing. Thank you. That's that's, that's that's been paying my salary for a few years now, and then. Um, the company I recently started is called Tension Dynamics. So I, have, I have another company that makes linear actuators. So we figured out a new type of linear actuator that's less expensive and can compress down smaller than the incumbent linear actuators on the market. And we're about six weeks out of stealth on that. I recently worked with the uh, Pittsburgh Technology Council uh, with another startup that came out of uh, the CMU lab for AI where they were monitoring um, particulate matter, pollution, and things like that, and they have an open database. I don't quite remember the name. Are you talking uh, about um, AirViz, I believe is the name? Yes, yeah, that is Hillary right. Airbox Airbus. company. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we helped them build a security framework oh, uh, cool. on how to secure their network, how to make sure things work out they want, the way they want to because uh, they wanted to go commercial with the product. Right now they are uh, uh, free to use. Uh, so we built a security strategy. I don't know what they're doing with it. Uh, a simple idea, but deep impact. Uh, I think that's that's the nature of stuff that comes out of CMU in general. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some hits and some misses in my opinion. You know, I, I mean, I think I think there's there's no question there's intelligent people doing doing incredible things, but you know, sometimes I feel like maybe not entirely paying attention to the market. You know, and I think that's true of, of all these academic yeah. startups, right? Like, I mean, you're you're in school, you're you're smart, you know, you're around other smart people, and sometimes it gets a little bit insular, and you stir up these ideas that you know aren't necessarily informed by the market, you know, but like you know they're yeah. cool and you know they take intelligence, but I don't know. I mean, maybe that's a cynical way of looking at it, but you're you're too close to the painting. You aren't seeing the full picture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's the issue. Do you want me to just blur uh, my it's eyes? A beautiful picture, if you so <laughs> Collaborative with Spencer Kraus is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. The, the space in which I work at uh, Zendes, in, I, I'm in the Bay Area, and a lot of startups from Berkeley reach out to me to either take a look at their product, to see if it's applicable in an enterprise setup. And it's similar, that is. I look at a few products and say, oh, I don't know, man. This is a chat GPT feature probably two weeks out. You don't want to be working on this. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. 
But nobody wants to hear that. You're you're just a naysayer at that point to like a startup yeah. founder. Yeah. Some of them are grateful. Like I mean, I, I've definitely been more candid than I should be with some of the startup founders that have approached you know me and SKA for like engineering help and. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I've, I'm at a point in my career, Akshay, where I just don't I don't really care what anyone thinks of me at this. I mean, like to some extent I do. Like, I, I you know, I can't, you know, be totally weird or, or do whatever I want. But I, at the same time, like, you know, I've, I've accomplished enough things that I feel like I can kind of I don't know if I like. OK, so the other day, for example, um, I was visiting a prospective client and um, they were giving us a set of objectives that they wanted to complete within a very short amount of time, which is one of our specialties is moving quickly. But like, you know, we can only move so fast. And so they were like, hey, we need, you know, this robotic software developed and it's got to be ready, you know, within four weeks from today. And we haven't negotiated the contract yet, which in my experience takes at least two weeks. And so it's like, okay, so we have two weeks to build this, you know, new piece of robotics. So- like, maybe, like, it depends what the state of what you've got is, but, you know, that's highly risky. And I, I'm just, I'm just, mm-hmm. front. I'm just like, I don't know, maybe, you know, <laughs> like, let's, you know. Some, some customers are, uh, what do you say, ambitious. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we, meet, we meet such uh, customers every day well, uh, at Sandisk as well. You know, people don't, hire external engineers when they think they can do it themselves <laughs> you know <laughs> so i think some people wait like a little bit too long and you know it's like oh, well yeah. I, I, you know I, I can't even help you at this point but you know if you had contacted me a month ago like you know then we might have something so, yeah yeah you know. so so uh question question about your latest company what are you guys putting those actuators into that's a good question. So to be honest, I'm going to contradict myself now and say, you know, we haven't actually identified our initial market yet. We made them with flight simulators in mind at first. Uh, so like fighter jet, helicopter simulators, they can move pretty aggressively mm. and they can, because of the big extent of compressed ratio, if you put them yeah. in a steward platform and, but if you, if you put them in the context of a steward platform, they can like get to like almost 90 degrees and, and move pretty fast. And you know, interesting. They, the acceleration like is pretty much as good as the you know the biggest motors you can fit in them and they're pretty low friction um good good like energy transmission um 97 percent efficient and so um you know with all that going on um we think it's set to be able to you know you could use them underwater you could use them in space uh you could use them in like you know like nasa johnson space center has shown interest for like um, moon excavation so because huh. they're built up of rotary joints instead of having a linear slide, those are easier to guard against um, debris yeah. and, and regolith is like the dirt on the moon. And it's, it's really nasty mm-hmm. and gets into stuff and messes it up. So, you know, that's why it's been suggested we use them for that use case. But um, another one is, you know, going to an army base like next week to talk to them about using them to like lift up trucks and move engines around and, and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's that powerful? Well, I mean, again, like the, the payload depends on the size we make it, but the architecture mm-hmm. can work from anywhere from like, Understood. you know, 500 pounds to like 45 tons, you know, or more. I mean, you can you can get it in, you know, the Vectran rope that we use to enable the technology that our provisional patent covers how we do it. You can you can get that stuff off the shelf, you know, that like yields at like, you know, I think like 45 tons last time I looked at a show. Wow. I mean, you know, so wow. it's pretty neat. Yeah, you can you can do a lot with it. And, you know, I mean, depending on what scale you go at, if you go smaller, you can make them out of like, you know, glass filled or other composite filled injection molded, you know, parts, which means you get a really low cost actuator, but it's still, you know, precise because of the nature of our tensioning mechanism. Or if you go bigger, then you might go to like forgings, you know, and or if you go space based, maybe you go composites just for the weight reduction mm. or maybe that's what the army wants because they also want it to be light so they can carry it out into, you know, the jungle or wherever they're at, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Um, I haven't, I haven't, I'm, I'm an electronics engineer. I have never touched uh, any sort of electronics after my engineering degree <laughs> so i became a, an mba after that um, you went right from undergrad was, to mba 
undergrad, I worked a bunch in uh, IT. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I did that for my first job out of Pitt as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, worked in, a, in a sense, not just IT. I was at Hewlett Packard uh, through an IT services company, but I was working on printers, cool, mechanical devices. And I was in the product engineering group trying to design the UX and how the uh, printer interacts with the human being. You know how crappy printers can be and how crappy. Were you designing like for consumer markets or were you designing? Commercial. 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 So if if you see at any Walmart or Rite Aid, you see those photo printing machines where you can pop in your, I don't know if anyone uses it anymore. Pop in your uh, thumb drive and get a picture printed. So those systems. That's pretty cool. It was it was pretty cool working alongside mechanical engineers who would actually do this, but they would put a brand new printer together out of three D printed fabricated parts. Cool. Back in two thousand seven. Yeah, it's um, yeah, that's when those were first coming on the scene, but still kind of ahead of your yeah. time because. Yeah, in those days you would have had to do a lot of babysitting to get a three D print to come out of an FDM printer. Were you using the Stratasys oh, machines like or were you using three weeks to print a small part <laughs> or something yeah. like that? Yeah. yeah, that's cool. And uh, after that, I did my MBA at Pitt, where uh, we met at CMU on a couple of uh, adventures. Then I went off and worked in consulting for a few years. You were uh, at I Deloitte, to... right? Deloitte, yeah. yeah. I didn't enjoy my stint there. It was terrible. Ah, oh, brutal. I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's not the work was good the work was great the people were assholes uh and you you need to be an asshole in consulting because it's a very competitive space Brutal. um yeah it's it's terrible it's not good for your mental health for the most part i've heard rosy stories from others but i don't trust them <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> my lived experience is the polar opposite of that no. Then I came to California, worked at Oracle in operations, went to a bank, worked in operations. Now I'm at Zendesk, trying to reinvent operations with AI. Let's see how successful we'll be. It's, uh, every, everyone says I have a cool job. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing for the most part. It's purely experimental. Um, so to that, to that point, at, at, what do you think? At what point will we see robots walking around, pulling paper out of printers or printing paper themselves? What, what's the future like? Well, so like, you know, what do you so think? zoom out a little bit, like the printer already is a robot, you know I mean? It, it... Sure. Sure. Like, I, I don't know if there's, in my opinion, I don't know if there's really an advantage to having a humanoid robot reach into a printer and grab a piece of paper. That just seems oh, like no, no, no. a huge waste of money. Yeah, yeah, it is. But, what but, I'm saying is, is there a space, is there a spot for robots alongside people in the office? Yeah, I mean, I think they're already there, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, some of the machines we use to manufacture things with CNC mills, mm. um, machine tending robots. Um, I mean, you look at, you know, the role that robots have played in the automotive industry since the 60s and 70s. I mean, you know, we've had robots that we've been working with you know, for quite a while now. And yeah, I mean, we're going to have them enter into more roles and we've seen it, right? I mean, when's the last time you went to a restaurant and... You know, there was a robot bringing out drinks. Like, it happens all the time. Like, there's restaurants in Pittsburgh that have robots at them. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah I haven't seen any in uh, the Bay Area. I should probably visit Pittsburgh. It's more technologically advanced than Bay Area. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are ahead of you guys in terms of robotics. I, I don't mean to, to, yeah, to boast. That's true. But, I mean, it probably is related to, to the universities and, and, you know, some of, you know, kind of the culture we've built up. I mean, Pittsburgh has something on the order of like 130, 140 robotics companies right now. Wow. And yeah, it's it's a serious robotics cluster. I mean, and, yeah. and you know, some of those are, are pretty large organizations with robotics, uh, you know, um, 
entities within them. So like Caterpillar has their Pittsburgh Automation Center here in Pittsburgh where they do automation for, you know, construction of mining vehicles. And, you know, I think Bosch has their research center right by there. And then um, another company, I'm trying to remember who it was, just opened an office. I haven't actually seen them do anything yet, but I just saw the signage on the door and they, they were opening it up. It was it was another I'm trying to remember who it was. It was another big one where you're like, huh, interesting, you know, that they moved in here, too. But, um, yeah, I mean, on the startup scene, there's there's a ton of them. Um, You know, there's there's some really interesting companies uh, that have a strong base here and in the Bay Area, like Formant Mm. is a good example of that, like a robot fleet management company that, you know, I I don't know if uh, they still have a San Francisco based office, but they did during the pandemic. They've got a strong presence here in Pittsburgh as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good place to be in, in the robotics, uh, discipline. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I think Silicon Valley, it started with hardware with Hewlett Packard, but they went all in on software and that's what you see across the board, Google, Meta, um, all the big companies here. Um, so there's no robotics to the extent that you're talking about in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, but I think that's changing. I, I know there are a couple of companies coming up. Uh, they're building humanoid robots. Tesla's obviously building it. I, I don't know how viable they are outside of the factory. Um, but Amazon's had that for a while, right? In their uh, warehouses, they bought a robotics company 10 years ago. You're referring to, to Kiva Systems? Somewhere. Say that again? You're referring to Kiva? Kiva, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They... They start early, um, but I don't know if Silicon Valley will make that pivot. Yeah, because I don't, know, I don't know if there's manufacturing here compared to the Rust Belt, as they say. Yeah, but I mean, we don't, I mean, I guess you're right. We do have some manufacturing here, but I mean, you can get stuff made in the Bay Area too, I think, at least at the R&D scale. I don't know. I mean, there's some mm-hmm. interesting initiatives going on right now in Pittsburgh. Like um, there's one... Um, you know, new manufacturing outfit that bought Alcoa's old headquarters and they've got a million square foot under roof and they're trying to do all these different things with manufacturing. And I probably shouldn't say what they are because I signed an NDA, but, you know, that's all public what I just said. <laughs> but, you know, there's um, there's some interesting things going on. Um, there's a company, <clears throat> Hellbender, that SKA Robotics has a strategic partnership that is growing pretty rapidly and, and making, you know, vision systems for robots and you know, being able to monitor the action at like a kid's soccer game or a major league sports event or like, you know, a dash cam that can map where it's at. And then you can sell those pictures to, you know, mapping companies that want to know where all the potholes are or where construction crews are at. Those are being made in Pittsburgh. Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, it's a lot of it's due to automation, though. Like you wouldn't be able to have competitive manufacturing even in a place like Pittsburgh. I think without, you know, utilization of robots, uh, just because there's there's cheaper mm. labor elsewhere in the world. I mean, yeah, yeah, so. that's true. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut but, you off. But with, uh, no, no, no. I, I was just curious. Um, I work with OpenAI technologies a lot on a daily basis. Given how far vision has come along, software-defined vision, d- is that sufficient for robotics to work with? Because the bandwidth pipe, pipe to get that work is pretty high. When you say software-defined uh, vision, uh, what does that refer to? I'm just not a term I'm intimately. In the sense, um, I can say, say I'm monitoring uh, traffic. Okay, somebody runs a red light. I can say, just look at the license plate. Don't look at anything else for privacy reasons, whatever it is. And that's pretty is good that the, doing that consistently in your in your. Case? Yeah, it's really good. It's really, really good. Yeah. Um, and also things like I, I met with this uh, uh, movie star from India. And uh, I was surprised when we talked about the movie production process. One of the steps in the movie production process is he sits at the back of the room with the test audience and notes down timestamps of when people pull out their phones and fixes that scene and the scene before and the scene after. So, yeah, (laughs) it's pretty cool, isn't it? 
uh, that they're uh, they're trying to make it interesting. So the frequency of phone pulls is reduced to zero, tends to zero. Yeah. What if you get someone that's really busy though? Like you get some studio exec that just has so much going on that you mean you could be Tom Cruise, you know, fighting, you know, John Claude Van Damme, you know, while you know the whole scene behind them catches fire. Yeah. And they're still yeah. like, I gotta get shit done, and then it fucks up your. Yeah, brain. yeah, of course. It's yeah. never gonna be fully zero, but, yeah. but he's trying to uh, increase the uh, uh, what do you say entertainment level at that point. Right, I like that. That's an level, interesting metric. Yeah, I'm like, okay, this is Kaizen in its original sense that like you're reducing waste and making continuous improvement, things it's like an that. Interesting way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, I'm an industry guy. Um, yeah. So I said, "All you don't have to do that. Your time is precious. Go shoot another movie. Just put a camera up there with a decent resolution. It'll run, uh, say, 20 frames uh, per minute through an ML model or just sent to ChatGPT, and it'll give you timestamps of when people pull out their phones. And uh, I was like, okay, yeah, let me try it out. I actually made it work on my laptop. It oh, works cool. pretty well. You should shoot uh, so over given, a video of that that we can we can splice in. I could, but I I'll have to check. All right, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't know. <laughs> I'm working uh, on a partnership with this dude. Um, so, given that state of the art, do you need to build vision systems at this point? Well, I mean, I guess what you're describing. The, to your earlier point, sounds like it's got a pretty intensive cloud component, and maybe that's not going to be the case much longer. But I mean, it, you know, it, it sounds impressive. I, I haven't used that as much in my work. I think just because a lot of what we do is on the edge, and so with um, with robotics, I mean, you got to be able to process it right there because you're not always going to have internet access. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So you, you can't the kind really... of robots I work on where they go into like, you know, nuclear power plants or, you know, like out into a field where they're building a solar field in the middle of nowhere. And there might not be or like a mine, you know, that's super remote and it might not have Internet access. Uh, then it's probably not a good use case for robotics uh, because you need a pretty solid data pipe um, going to whatever ML endpoint. Well, not, or, uh, not necessarily for field robotics, though. I mean, for what you're describing, yes. But what I'm saying is that's not the case in a lot of these robotics right. applications that, that I work on. So what 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 does it process? Very specific vision components? You're trying to find very specific elements within a scene? I mean, that's a segmentation problem you're describing, and that does come up. But, you know, like... Mm. The sorts of things that, that SK Robotics uh, works on are more like along the lines of, um, you know, there's a heavy mechanical component and like sometimes a heavy mm. electrical component and sometimes a heavy perception component, to your point. Mm. Uh, often, you know, firmware is important, you know, like, you know, a client will come and say, hey, we just want to be able to do uh, over the air firmware updates, you know, in a repeatable way and have a good architecture for that. And can you help us get set up or hey, we're trying to build this robot to construct solar fields, and can you help us with our systems engineering so that the lower-level engineering disciplines are more directed and they don't make mistakes and cost us as much money? You know, Interesting. To extent. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be mistakes in engineering, but you know, can you funnel it in with a concerted upfront systems engineering effort? Hey, we're having trouble detecting solar panels. Can you help us on the algorithm side so that we have you know, a better success rate on segmentation? You know, mm. that point. Mm. So... Interesting. I, I always keep thinking about whenever these problems come up, um, I'm from India, uh, and you cannot have high cost and even medium to high cost systems like this commercialized in India. So I keep thinking about low cost. And I'm worried that there may never be a low cost system for developing nations with AI. It's so compute heavy right now. And the chips are basically locked down. <laughs> you cannot really sell the chips outside the United States without the government saying, okay. Uh, are you seeing any low-cost applications uh, so in my, the my friend Nathan, vision space? My friend Nathan George is very interested in low-cost, but 
robotics, but he, he tends to go away from vision and like, you know, for localization instead of using like a simultaneous localization and mapping approach, like a slam, mm. like he tends to favor, you know, like RTK corrected GPS because it's cheaper or mm. using inertial measurement units because, you know, they're like eight bucks. I see. If you get like a Bosch one out of a cell phone. And so, I mean, there's, there's ways to do it that, that maybe aren't as, you know, computationally intense and, mm. It's valuable, you know, not just in, you know, nations that don't have the same amount of money, but also in, you know, consumer applications or, you know, like, I don't know, like if you want to try to get a large amount of volume of stuff out, you can't. Some of these premium price things that, you know, that admittedly, you know, my company's worked on and, you know, that, that exist. I mean, you know, like if you look at you know, some of the earlier robots in particular, like, you know, it's not cheap to make a robot, like, especially the first one. Um, like, I, I think, you know, that's often because there's a business case, you know, for like a small yeah. quantity at a high price. I mean, yes, you know, yeah. again, if you're if you're doing maintenance on, you know, like a generator or if you're like, you know, like a, a really, you know, like a one and a half gigawatt generator in a nuclear power plant and you need you know, a robot that can go in and do that. Or like if you're trying to clean up, you know, Fukushima or Three Mile hmm. Island or, you know, if you want to... Is that even possible? What do you mean? It, it, can you actually clean up Fukushima in the sense that can we get to a ground state where there's a concrete platform and nothing else? Well, so I, I'm not an expert on, on like nuclear, uh, you know, disasters, but, you know, I did watch the Chernobyl special on HBO for what it's worth. <laughs> Not we're all hp experts <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh you know i mean in in that in that movie like they show a scene where they're like they're trying to get robots to and then the german robot breaks they they find like the only robot that can handle the radiation and then it can't handle <laughs> it and it just craps out but i mean i don't know like just for like basic operations like to be able to to move things around or to be able to you know like you know dump something in a spent fuel pool or you know, to do mm -hmm. reactor inspection and maintenance, like you, I'd rather have a robot for that than a person. I mean, when, yeah. you, when you get more computationally intense, it gets tricky. Like, again, my limited knowledge, this is not my expertise area. But like, you know, if you get something like, you know, an NVIDIA GPU and you put that close to radiation, it's going to break because there's lots of, you know, things going on and it's fragile. But, you know, the closer you get to, you know, just you know, old school, you know, resistor capacitor circuits. I mean, like the more resilient you are because you can punch a big hole in that and it still runs, you know, so. That's interesting. Uh, so AI fails, so. Uh. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe at the other end of a tether is how you would do that. Like if you had a wire going out into your hot area and then. Got uh, it, got it. But like, yeah. I mean, even like polymers and elastomers, like I'm told, like don't do well in, in high radiation environments, like the rubber in the cable will start to you know break down and so of course of course yeah yeah you're dealing with quantum at that point and everything's a fair game everything can be knocked loose uh from the atomic structure in a radioactive uh, uh, environment that obviously makes sense yeah um yeah i'm, I'm I, every day i'm conflicted by this whole thing um i look at ai look at possibilities make some possibilities happen and then there's this point where you realize oh crap okay this this is 20 percent of my work this is 30 percent of my work but then to actually operationalize it you need a lot more and you come to a point where you realize this is really crappy you can't really get anything done uh, You're talking about delegating your own job to chat GPT, like that yeah, context yeah. of AI? Okay. Yeah, do the planning, do the structure development, put things together for me, give me a plan. Uh, essentially, what I want to do is give it a task and get it done, like I would to my team. And I don't know how far that is, uh, but looking at uh, Tesla factories, Volkswagen factories, they get tasks done, but I uh, what what's your point of view on the, how much work goes on behind the scenes, behind all those robots going ping ping pong, and getting a car out on the other side? So I've never been in a Tesla or a Volkswagen factory. I have been in an automotive plant before that mm -hmm. was heavily roboticized. Um, 
I guess my understanding is that the robots that work in automotive facilities are like very mature technology. Like they're doing inverse kinematics, mm. but you know, they're, they're following scripts. They're, they're going to pre set points and they're, they're running, you know, the same program over and over and over again. And so I, I, it's, it's at least what I've observed um, when I've been in those types of environments, mm. maybe the technology is evolving from there. And, and I've seen some impressive demos, like you know, robots being able to block off certain areas in space so that another robot can come in without hitting the first robot. Um, there, was, there was a company in Boston doing that. That was it was pretty impressive. I, I, I stumbled into their office, you know, during a trade show, and they, they gave me a good demonstration of that. But um, you know, you're still you're kind of just walking around these different obstacles, and this guy has to pause so this guy can come over here, and then. You know, you're, you're you're basically blocking off voxels, you know, in the shape of a robot, and then the other robots working around that obstacle, at least as well. Ah, interesting. Uh, that's that's pretty cool. So there is there is a lot of. I'm just wondering when we'll run out of work to do with AI, and I don't think we'll run out of work to do. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah, I mean, at least we. Uh huh. There's Good. certain cases that I think AI just like in its current state, at least, isn't applicable to. I mean, like. You know, one of them I talked about was like certain edge computing scenarios where, you know, it's just mm. not the best tool for the job. I mean, I would say, you know, motion control, like, I mean, I guess you could call like certain types of motion controls that auto tune and compensate like a form of AI, depending on how you define AI. Mm. But, you know, I mean, I don't know, like industrial robots and safety critical systems. I think people are less inclined to trust AI to, I see. That's to, true. to do those sorts of things. Just because you know, mm. if you if you screw up even like point one percent of the time, I mean, you're gonna cause a lot of damage. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, yeah, you're right. There's there's probably I my wife keeps telling me you're a doomsday expert at this point. Uh, you keep saying yeah, I will do everything, but I don't think so. It's uh, I've come to a realization over the last year and a half that these systems are not yet ready for that kind of work. Um, and it's, they're probably not going to be ready that, for that kind of work. Human ingenuity will remain at the forefront. Um, but I keep hearing these people, man. Uh, our uh, leader, Elon Musk, or uh, whoever, whoever the robotics fanatics are at this point, that yeah, it's going to take everything. They're going to do everything. Is he still saying well, that? Yeah, yeah this, this was... Uh. In the last investor call, that huh. it was a it was an interesting conversation to say the least, where he said there's a market for eight billion humanoid robots in the world. I don't know how. Um, Based off of what? Yeah, I kind of wonder. No, never mind. Because there are eight billion people. No, I on get the planet. that, but yeah, but are you going to buy a humanoid a humanoid robot for yourself? Each one of us. Uh, that's equating it to a cell phone, yeah. technically. Yeah, well, and I mean, uh, not every human is even doing useful work right now, right? I mean, like, yeah. a lot of them just <laughs> sit around. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. I do that once in a while. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I wonder, uh, okay, let's, let's take the scenario where they've eliminated all work. Who are they going to sell stuff to? Isn't that what society is? For the most part, buy and sell stuff. Uh, that's your fulfillment. That's your job. That's your business. If nobody's doing nothing, what are you selling and to who? It's yeah, interesting. I, yeah. I, I see your point there. and I mean, I don't know if we're at a point where we have the technology where that's manifested yet, but you're right. If, if we went to that type of future, you know, I mean... The way I tend to go with that question is, you know, well, how do we unlock more human productivity? Because I, I know myself and, and I get very bored if I don't have stimulation. Yeah. And that's when I start causing trouble and, you know, becoming a menace to society. And so, I mean, I think for me at least, right, if I find a way to like, and, I mean, I don't know, I guess to some extent, like, you know, I, I send things I would have done myself in the past to like chat GPT now. So. You know, I'll be like, hey, you know, like, can you illustrate me 
a futuristic looking, you know, magnetic crawler robot with a lot of cameras. I did that for like a client presentation the other day. And then it came up back with this creepy looking thing. It had like 60 cameras on it. So I'm like, okay, no less cameras. And it's like, okay, <laughs> now it's got like 16 cameras. I'm like, okay, now make it lower profile. And then now it's got four. I'm like, okay, that's, that looks like a real robot. So <laughs> sweet rendering, you know? And so um, I, I gave that to a, uh, I put that in a client presentation and one of my clients, uh, one of the people at the client said, um, you know, uh, what scale is that robot? I'm like, it's, it's not real. It's chat GPT. Like it's just made up, you know, they're like, Oh, okay. I don't know. It's gotten convincing. I mean, that's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> what scale is it? That's interesting. You could actually pitch a product that's vaporware. I'm sure. I mean, people do it all the time, right? Like, you know, yeah. Elizabeth Holmes, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> Dear God. Uh, I heard some companies doing what you want to do, but actually works. Uh, I read about it a couple of weeks ago, so hopefully that works out. I, I haven't heard about that yet, but good, good for them. Akshay, as we get to the end of the episode, uh, is there anything you want to plug? Yeah, uh, learn AI, I think, for your own good at this point. Learn robotics. I think that's the way of the future. Um, so you stay employed, irrespective of what happens, what we've learned out of this discussion, at least as people are required to do robotics, do AI. So stay in school, learn stuff, learn how to code, become a good human being. That's about it. Sweet. Yeah. Be a good human being. Right. Great word stand on. All right, brother. <laughs> Pleasure having you. All right. Perfect. This was so good. Thanks, Spencer. Yeah, for sure, Akshay. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.